<clears throat> Welcome everyone to the February 2019 ITBT Transmart Foundation community meeting. These meeting these sessions are held um, once a month on the third Tuesday of the month uh, at this time. Uh, you can find information uh, on the, the upcoming meeting on our website and all the previous presentations and uh, slide decks uh, are available there. <clears throat> the agenda for today's meeting is here. And I'd like to turn it over to Diane Keo, who is the uh, Managing Director of the Foundation. Diane? Hi, everybody. Um, good morning or good evening, depending on um, what part of the world you're in. Um, happy uh, February. The good news is February will be over soon and we'll uh, get out of this winter uh, winter time. Um, we have a pretty um, packed agenda. We wanted to give you a general update um, on a number of things, um, as well as giving you an update on um, a couple of uh, new releases that are, that are uh, um, coming about very soon. Um, so next slide, um, Rudy. The, what, what I wanted to do is I wanted to start out with um, playing a, a quick uh, three-minute videotape um, that um, Griffin Weber actually um, put together for us. Um, you know, we, we've, had, we've had a number of people really kind of confused about what the three separate platforms were and, and what we really are as, a, uh, as an organization and what we do, what kind of use cases uh, fall under our, our umbrella. And so what we did was kind of broke things out and put together a um, sort of a, a, a kind of a, a marketing overview um, really it doesn't go into a lot of detail but a marketing overview to help um, people understand um, the types of platforms we have and the use cases that um, we support and I think that um, Griffin I really want to thank him very much for um, for doing the work and I think this um, sums it up nicely and I um, I just wanted to, to kick it off um, showing you this video so we if to with you uh, with video play. There we go. Rudy, can you hear the video? I can't hear it. Uh, no audio? No audio. You're not hearing it, right? No. Uh, Well, we'll try for another second if we can't get it. Yep, sorry. Yep. All right. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's playing fine on my machine. Yeah, no, I know. I don't know what's going on. All right. Um, I, I would encourage, um, it is on our website. I would encourage folks to take a look at um, the video. Um, it talks about the core components. Um, it also talks about um, the um, high level use cases that the platforms um, uh, support. Um, this is this is really in an effort. I mean, the people that use this, you know, uh, there are platforms understand the uses, but this is really a, a better way for um, people, external folks, to really understand um, the platforms and the uses. So, oh well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll skip that. We'll go to the website. So, we want to go to the next slide. So, um, I wanted to um, to welcome um, a couple of new contributing sponsors. Go to the next slide. Um, just to remind everyone, we are a nonprofit organization. We do rely on um, these contributions to keep us going, um, to provide basic operational support. Um, here's a list of the, uh, the, the organizations that have um, 
uh, signed up to be contributing sponsors. We have two new ones, the University of um, uh, uh, Gotten, Gottingen, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, in uh, Germany, uh, UMG, um, and a brand new uh, sponsor that just signed up last week, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, Clinical and Translational Science um, Institute uh, for, from Wake Forest School of Medicine. So thanks to those two new um, sponsors. We'd, uh, we'd love to have your, your organizations um, uh, listed on, on, our, um, on our list. So um, it's $5,000 a, a year uh, to become a contributing sponsor for the organization. Uh, next slide. Um, we've talked about this before, but um, here, are, here are some of the benefits of the program. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but um, we are we are we are going to be charging for the um, the foundation events um, now to help cover some of the costs of the the food and the um, the venue. So um, if you're a sponsor, there's two free tickets. Um, you know, recognition in our um, at our at our meetings and also our our regular e blasts. Um, and what and what we, what this supports is really the basic operations of the foundation. So our monthly meetings, the training programs, the organization of the um, the conferences, support of the project management committees, support of the website, and etc. So um, we'd love to have your name listed. So please uh, please let us know. We can go to the next slide, Ruby. Um, so there's a there's a number of uh, meetings um, that will take place this year. I want to highlight just a couple of them, but go to the next slide. I'll show you the list. Um, so this is a complete list of the translational science meetings and events um, in uh, 2019. Um, the two I want to highlight, um, the AMIA um, Informatics Summit that's coming up on um, March 25th, 28th in San Francisco. Um, and also Rudy will talk about the Harvard Symposium uh, we don't have a formal event planned for um, AMIA in March, but um, what we'd like to do, and I think I'm going to be sending a, um, a note out to the uh, members in the next um, week or so, is to organize um, a dinner um, either on the Tuesday, it's either the 26th or the 27th. I want to find out what, um, what evening is the best, but I think getting people together in an informal setting and, uh, and just, you know, talking is going to be uh, really um, fun and important. So I'll get that out soon to, to try to organize something there. Um, and again, we'll talk about the June meeting in more detail um, in a little bit. So next slide, Rudy. So the working groups, um, I'm not going to give a detailed update about all of the working groups, but I did mention, and Rudy, you could go to the, the next slide. Um, this this was something that we kicked off um, a little over a year ago. Um, the, the members thought it would be a really good idea to pull together working groups. And um, so far, the uh, four working groups have been um, set up. User interface ontologies, um, ETL, and use cases. Um, I, the, the, the membership of these groups um, continue to grow. They're, um, they meet on a monthly basis. Um, they have very strong chairs that are leading these. Um, you know, I think I think this is a, a very important um, component of the foundation. Um, I just wanted to mention two in particular: the user interface group chaired by Griffin Weber. His focus has really been to do a, a landscape analysis of the different uh, user interfaces that are out there and try to understand, you know, what the differences are and what people, you know, uh, like and what they don't like, and what they need in their um, user interface. Um, this work has proven to be very important because the um, the ACT group, um, Accrual for Clinical Trials group, which is the uh, group growing in the U.S. that really is the, the largest shrine network um, in the world, um, has made a decision to support the, um, the rewrite of the shrine UI. And the shrine UI looked a lot like I2D2. Um, and so they we were able to use the, the um, the information that Griffin and the user interface pulled together to help really influence, um, you know, the direction of, of that new UI. Um, it's going to be important. And a lot of, you know, ITV2 users are part of the ACT network, um, and so they'll have a more simplified, streamlined um, user interface, which is um, really yeah, going to be very exciting. Um, the other, I want to, the other thing I want to mention is the use case working group um, has just um, gotten off the ground. 
Um, so far we have 19 members and we're you know, in the process of really pulling together you know, use cases and user stories to help um, support what, um, how people are using um, our, our platforms. Um, so that's gonna, that's gonna be very important um, as well. And so we'll, we'll have that group uh, be presenting at um, probably an upcoming um, community meeting soon. Um, so next slide, Rudy. And I will turn, um, Rudy, I'm gonna turn this over to you to talk about the, um, the Harvard Symposium in June. Okay, thanks, Diane. So hopefully you know that we're uh, having the, our, again, our symposium at Harvard Medical School. Uh, this year is going to be on June uh, 17th and 18th, um, being held um, at a slightly different building, uh, adjacent building at Simmons College, um, <clears throat> and then second day again at Countway Library. Um, relatively similar format. Uh, the first day we're really trying to focus on presentations, but this year uh, the, the hope is to have uh, a number of you speaking and about your projects and uh, successes and how you're using the, the platforms. And that's really the goal of the, the first day, along with a couple of uh, keynotes. Um, we have John Brownstein from Harvard Medical School talking about incubating innovation in an academic medical center um, and um, <clears throat> presenting uh, from his experiences um, uh, What's, what's the latest um, going on there in terms of, of in innovation? And then uh, David Shewitz from uh, Takeda will be speaking on um, novelty to necessity, data science and technology in pharma R&D. <clears throat> of course, we will have presentations by Zach, uh, Sean, uh, Sean Murphy and Paul Viak uh, about in terms of the, the types of things that are that they see coming in terms of the future of precision medicine uh, what's coming up in I2B2, and um, Paul talking more about I2B2 Transmar and its evolution. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, the main focus of the day is going to be trying to get a number of uh, case studies, 30-minute presentations uh, on what um, what people are doing, uh, and then uh, a couple of what I call lightning case studies, just quick 15-minute um, talks on uh, projects. Uh, and uh, already, uh, Andreas Kretzer's lab at University of Michigan, they're going to be talking about some of the work they're doing. They've already signed up, but um, please at the website, you can see uh, a sign up there where uh, if you want to present in one of these 30 minutes uh, sessions or uh, one of the lightning case studies, or if you want to present a poster, um, you can sign up now. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the second day uh, we've got uh, sketched out so far, uh, working group sessions, all the working groups will will be talking. Um, and, and I see I've left off the ETL working group that will be also uh, there. Uh, last year, we had a very active discussion in the ACT. Uh, the ACT group um, had um, uh, the whole afternoon session, and they'll be doing that again this year. Uh, and then we will have a foundation platform uh, open discussion. Uh, probably more things will be organized in here. This is just what we have today so far. Um, the registration site will be available within a day or two. Um, uh, this year, uh, the board has decided that we, we need to, to start charging for our events. And so we've put a, um, a fee of $200 per attendee uh, to come to the sessions uh, to help us with the costs. Um, and so that will be reflected when the, uh, during the registration. Um, students will be free. Uh, so any students who will, will be attending uh, can attend for free and uh, of course our contributing members get um, two free tickets to these to these uh, sessions um, all of this uh, is uh, outlined on the the website for the event and as i say the registration will be open within a day or two uh, we also have a hotel uh, with special rates for us uh, that's available <clears throat> so there's the details um, of what we have so far and uh, more will be coming as we start to fill in the agenda Okay, um, now we're gonna switch to, uh, we have two presentations, one on the upcoming I2B2 release and one on the I2B2 Transmart release. Um, just to remind us where we are, the, the current releases of the products are, are shown here, uh, I2B2 Transmart and I2B2 Transmart. Um, both I2B2 and I2B2 Transmart are coming up to a, a new a, a release. Um, 
just a quick note on Transmart, we are working on the 16.4 release and that will be uh, coming out in the spring. Um, and we'll have more details on that at the next meeting. But for today, uh, I'm like, happy to introduce Mike Mendez, who will talk about the I2B2 release on .7.11. Uh, Mike, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Rudy. Okay, you want to do the next slide? Yep. Okay, so yeah, so in 1.7.11, we did a lot of, uh, we did some enhancements, we did some cleanups, we also did a lot of things. So one thing that we, uh, uh, that ITB2 was able to do, but the web client wasn't able to implement, was the ability to drag over patients, individual patients, into the concept dimension table, and into the query tool table. So what we did is we implemented that if you create a patient set, you can actually drag an individual patient from that patient set to the query tool, or you can drag that patient over into the a work, uh, workplace folder. And so, so then you can have a list of uh, patients in your workplace folder. You can also create a folder of patients and then drag those patient, that folder over to the work, uh, work uh, query tool table, query tool and then all the patients will appear in that. Uh, the folder can also contain other things such as like ontologies or previous queries as they have in the past. So that was uh, one of the enhancements that we did to the workplace folder. Uh, Nitch did a lot of work on the previous queries in that he enabled uh, the ability to fil filter by users. You can do paging back and forth. Uh, it does auto refresh for timed intervals. Uh, and then the ability to do searches of previous queries. Uh, and so another new feature that we added was the identity data plan. And what this allows is that you can have ontologies that have uh, that are, can only be seen by certain roles. So for example, say so you had wanted to do searches by uh, PHI information, such as like medical record numbers or first names. You could have an ontology that would have that type of information, and and then only people who are say data pro have the ability to actually see that ontology. And so once they once, if they have access, they'll see it, and it'll have like a little it'll be designated that it's a uh, higher rated, higher rolled ontology. And so that will allow you to have identified data if you wish in the I2B2. Uh, we also upgraded or changed our license. So before we had this I2B2, uh, I think it was like version 2.1 or something of our uh, source code license. Uh, we moved over to a Mozilla uh, uh, version, two, version 2, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Rudy or Diane, um, but now yeah, we're under right. a new license plate. Okay, <laughs> I always get confused whether that or Apache. I know, uh, but yeah, so it is the Mozilla one. Um, so yeah, so we moved over to that new license plan, and there's like an addendum in there for the healthcare aspect. Uh, the other thing that we also did was we upgraded to uh, Wildfly 14. Uh, previously, we were at Wildfly 10, and uh, so, but the I2B2 software still works with uh, I2B2 10, uh, I2B2, uh, Wildfly 10, and also with uh, JBoss uh, 7.1.1. But we do recommend that at least go to Wildfly 10 just for the security enhancements. Uh, the upgrade process is basically straightforward. The directory structure is, a, is virtually the same. Um, so yeah, so Wildfly 14, and then in the future we'll be uh, uh, looking at ways to doing hot deployment of uh, the data source. And so basically everything could be done through the web without having to actually create data source files, uh, those XML files that you put in the deployment folder. We can, have, can do everything through the uh, Wildfly administration tool. Uh, we also did some documentation of how to use SSL on the ITB2, so on, mainly on the work on the Wildfly and database side, um, there's plenty of documentation out there about how to uh, like have Apache have SSL so that the end user, when using the web client, that would be secure. But there was always between the web server and all the way to the database that was usually unsecured. 
uh, so we have documentation of how to make it from Apache to Wildfly as using SSL, and then also from Apache from Wildfly to the database using SSL, whether it's on Oracle, Postgres, or uh, SQL Server. So that's uh, the main parts of what, that 7.11. We're hoping to have it out within a few weeks, uh, and so. If all goes well, we should have a release very soon with this. Great, thanks, Rudy. Okay, thank, thank you, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I think we'll uh, move on. Next, um, we've got Jason Stedman from uh, Paul VX Group at Harvard, and he's going to talk about the uh, upcoming release of um, I2B2 Transmar. Are you there, Jason? Uh, yes, thanks, Rudy. And uh, I'm good to hear uh, about the I2B2 release. I do want to correct one uh, error. I think it was like the, the slide right before Mike started speaking. Okay. Uh, the version matrix. Um, the version that is in the uh, I2B2 Transmart platform uh, of I2B2, I believe, is actually based off 1.7. Uh, 10 or 1.7.9. Ah, okay. And we did okay. fork it and, have, and make some changes, but um, I just wanted to uh, uh, point that out. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry for flipping the slides so fast. All right, go ahead. So uh, we've been working at Harvard at, for moving our uh, from our just quick start only release uh, into a production release. Uh, obviously, in, produ in production, you have a lot more to consider. Uh, quick start, the goal was to get as much feedback as we could from the community without people having to devote too much in resources um, to actually see Transmart uh, and I2B2 running and get a feel for what the platform could do and potentially identify features that either were not working as intended or uh, perhaps we're missing uh, from our scope of what I2B2 Transmart is, uh, because as we all know, there are many different plugins and many different use cases uh, that the community has uh, that may or may not have been released uh, uh, to the rest of the community, and we have no way of necessarily knowing if, if we've caught all the uh, edge cases. Um, and you know, the, the quick start really was about just how can we make this thing happen in as few commands po as possible. Um, and one of the major pieces of feedback that we got is that it does require a lot of compute resources to run, uh, which is, you know, something that we're trying to uh, pare down a little bit with the production deploy. Um, but really, if we go on to the next slide, I don't know if I can advance this from here or, Rudy? Oh, there we go. Uh, you know, when we move into production, you know, we can only make it so simple. There are just some concerns you're gonna have in production regarding backup, uh, re regarding log aggregation and, you know, off-siting of things, if that's required in your environment. Um, and, you know, we do those things but the way that we do those things is probably different from how you do those things. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to provide a middle ground uh, Docker-based, uh, could I have the next slide, Rudy? Uh, and actually, we'll skip this one too. I kind of already covered that. Right, so Docker-based, but not so Docker that you couldn't deploy it on bare metal if you wanted to. Uh, so if you look at the quick start, everything's in volumes, everything's hidden uh, from the user, and you really have to understand Docker to figure out how things are configured. Uh, for the production release, we're trying to make it so that anything you would ever want to touch or back up is either not part of the Docker deployment at all, for instance, the databases are not in Docker, uh, mainly because you couldn't back up the data anyway, but also because a Docker container could get shut down at any moment. 
Uh, and if your database goes away, your application is useless. And also logs, configuration files, you know, you might want to back up the logs for compliance concerns and configuration files. Of course, you're going to want to uh, manage uh, properly to make sure that they don't change uh, without authorization and all that stuff. And the easiest way to do that uh, if you're running Docker is to have them mapped to a path on the host that you can monitor. Uh, so we're going to be or we are in the process of backing out all of those things from being embedded in the images themselves into being something that can be configured in a traditional way. So for instance, your Wildfly standalone.xml is on a, on a path on your host that you're running your Docker container in. And if you're not running Docker, that same path can be used you know, to, to find the configurable standalone XML that you wanna put in your Wildfly distribution. Uh, could we move on to the next slide? Uh, so this is kind of our view of what Transmar 18.1 consists of. We have clinical registry data, uh, which is in I2B2 uh, as well as in uh, Picture HPDS, which um, was presented in Geneva. I don't think that presentation is available though uh, online and uh, also some VCF data that is in HPDS, and we'll be including data loaders for that in our ETL tool. Um, and then also, you know, in sort of the application layer, we've got a picture API for access from other applications as well as from the picture user interface, and for Transmart's uh, Fractalis plugin uh, to get its data through its ETLs. The Transmart user interface, and also behind the scenes, the I2B2 core services, so that if you wanted to put the I2B2 user interface or other applications that use I2B2, uh, that would be fairly straightforward. Uh, could we go on to the next slide? I don't know how many people have seen this uh, slide before, but this is the ETL client that we were releasing as part of 18.1. Uh, it includes Everything from, you know, you, you start with your, your CSV files that have all your data and your VCF files and all that stuff. Run some Docker pipelines. Uh, we're also going to be including uh, instructions for how to run it without Docker, but uh, not, you know, obviously we can't be uh, distribution specific with that, so they're fairly high level instructions. Um, and the Docker ETL client provides you a way to build your mapping file and then map your data into I2B2, which can then be dumped into your HPDS data store as well to drive the picture UI uh, with all the nice counts functionality that that provides uh, as well as data export. Um, and could we go forward a slide? And this is kind of the level of complexity that we start thinking about with production. So you've got your, your data comes from somewhere at HMS, it's from S3. It might be different in your environment. Our data stores, the relational DBs, Oracle, MySQL, those are in AWS. Uh, there are RDS instances for us. They may not be for you. Uh, we have Splunk uh, ingesting all of our logs. You might have ELK or you might have another strategy for backing them up uh, or offsiting them. Uh, and we use Auth0. We don't have an option other than Auth0 to present you with that supports all of the different pieces here. Um, but certainly the Transmart default and I2B2 default authorization stuff, uh, the code is still there. You can still configure it, but it's not how we do things here. Uh, and of course, um, you know there are pieces on this diagram that are not part of the release. If we go to the next slide. So we use these things, anything in, in a yellow box at HMS in our environments to meet our compliance requirements, to meet our institutional needs. Uh, your needs may be different and your tools may be different. So if you don't use these tools, that's fine. But the pieces that are not outlined in orange or in gold, I guess that color is, uh, are actually part of the I2B2 Transmart 
release, including the uh, picture auth micro app. Now you'll notice all of the red dotted lines uh, represent uh, authorization interactions. So uh, we've implemented in the picture auth micro app the ability to control access to really any arbitrary application as long as it supports RFC 7662 uh, token introspection roughly. We've made a slight change to the specification to use JSON instead of uh, XML uh, form URL encoding, just because it makes it makes integration a lot simpler with more modern tools. Um, but effectively, any web application can be made to work with uh, Picture Auth Micro App, and uh, you can very flexibly define uh, constraints for your different roles in your different applications, and the application can actually send some metadata as a JSON query to the Picture Auth Micro App when it does its token introspection. And Picture Auth Micro App will make an authorization decision on, for the application using uh, matchers that basically say, okay, well, if you included this specific path, we're going to deny your query, or unless you included this specific path, we won't allow your query. So for instance, if you've seen my uh, picture UI demo uh, in the, or if you've run the quick start, uh, the NHANES uh, simple UI that comes in the quick start now, uh, you can actually export all the data uh, using sort of a panel on the right. When you do that, it submits a what we call a data frame request to the picture API 2. And using PSAMA, that same query, that JSON that the UI would send in, gets forwarded with the token introspection request to the picture auth micro app. Picture auth micro app has a rule in it that says you must have a certain level of access or you cannot include a expected result type data frame in your JSON of your query. Uh, so we don't actually have to run any uh, query the data at all. We can just see what you're trying to do and say whether or not you're allowed to do that. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, so there, there's a lot of complexity here and we're getting closer by the day. Uh, we're fairly behind on our, our deployment, you know, our, our delivery schedule for this. I'm really hoping that the first week of March, uh, we'll be able to release a first version of this. Um, and hopefully we'll get some feedback from the community uh, telling us what is, is and is not working and what level of complexity people are willing to adopt. Um, uh, but that, I believe, is the end of my presentation. I don't think I have any more slides, right, Rudy? No, that, that, this is the last one, you're right. Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, and of course I'm available okay, for any you. questions or I don't think there are any questions yeah. in the panel right now. Um, yeah, we've got questions in a, in a second. I, I do want to say, well, thank you um, for the presentation, Jason, um, and also Mike. Um, we, uh, we are talking with, um, to, to try to put together a few uh, webinars in the maybe March, April timeframe, both from a uh, user perspective of what, what the ITB2 Transmart platform can do and also some of the technical details. And so we'll, we're going to get those scheduled, but we're trying to let the team uh, get through the production um, release first, uh, and then we'll get those set up. And then, of course, in the, at the June, at the Harvard meeting in June, uh, we will have some sessions uh, as well. <clears throat> Thank you. So I think now we can open up to questions on uh, anything uh, that we covered today. Um, to ask a question, you can raise your hand. Uh, you can type a question in the question window or put something in the chat window. Uh, yeah, I just want, wanted to know if you have any more information on the ETL client that there was on your slide. What uh, what technology you'll be using for that? 
so Ranjay and our team leads, leads that initiative. Uh, I believe it's no longer using the uh, Pentaho uh, framework that the old Transmodal ETL that we're using was. Um, and I think it's actually just uh, written in Java. Um, but I, I can get more details. I just don't have them for you right now. Right. OK, thanks. <clears throat> okay, does um, Michael Horvath, you have a question? Uh, hey guys, actually, I just got Ronnie. Um, would you like, he can tell you a little more about the technology behind the ETL client. Okay, go ahead. Hi, hi, this is Ranjay. Uh, like, you know, the technology we use for the ETL client is completely Java, like the tool is completely written in Java. Basically, it's a parser of the CSV files, and the parsing basically gets mapped to the I2B2 tables. So we have a, like, you know, GitHub repo where you can also go and look at the code. It's basically made up of three components. We have entity generator, we have parser, and then we have the loader. So I can send you the link for that. And I, it's, it's also available on the Twitch start GitHub repo. You can go for, take it from there. But it's completely written in Java right now. Okay. Does, does that answer okay, your thanks. question? Yeah, that, that, yeah, I was wondering what what the roadmap was regarding the Pentaho kettle. Uh, so, that, so the Pentaho kettle's now been dropped uh, definitively, has it? Like we like earlier, we have used kettle, but it did not fit our purpose because most of the time we were struggling with the tool itself. Yeah, and to make it work with the with the schema. So basically, we made a decision to rewrite the tool in a very simple way, which serves the purpose of loading the data in I2B2 class smart. Right. So the okay, so, was a lot, like with the configuration files. Okay, so it's so the passing and the loading, the everything's done in Java now. Is that yes. That? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, any other questions? We, we also have, of course, our ongoing training program that's available on the last Friday of every month. We have a, a training session, and these include topics on I2B2, uh, on Transmart, and uh, soon we'll have some I2B2 Transmart uh, topics. Uh, and again, uh, at the website, there's a lot of information about what the different sessions are, and these are all contributed by um, different vendors who, who work with us, uh, the Hive, Rancho, Clarivate, um, et cetera. <clears throat> Please take a look at that. If you are planning to come to, to the Harvard meeting, we'd like you to, you know, we'll get the registration site up shortly and then we'll be uh, asking you to please try to register as soon as you can to let us know so we can start planning. Um, for the right number of people. Diane, I don't see anything else. Do you have any closing remarks? I just, I just had one other thing I wanted to um, make sure that I mentioned. We, you know, we talked a lot about the June Harvard meeting, um, and I think the planning around that is, is coming along nicely. Um, we, we still do not have a, a date or a venue um, selected for a fall meeting, a European uh, fall meeting. Um, so for the for the folks that that are um, you know in Europe, if anybody is interested in, in really um, helping us work on that, that would be great. Um, we really rely on you know folks in Europe to help you know choose a, a venue and, and kind of help get get it started. So um, you know please uh, think about that and let us know if um, if you uh, have ideas. Um, other than that, I I, I think that you know, we can end 15 minutes early unless there's any more um, questions. There's one more I see um, from Bo Fold. This, uh, 
in the uh, in the last production slide that Jason had, there was something the AWS SageMaker was there. And did, could you give us a quick answer on what that's used for, Jason? You're still there. Yeah. So. Um... You know, again, that, that's not uh, Jupiter and SageMaker and some of the other. If you pull up that slide again, uh, okay. Rudy. Right. So no, notice that there are orange or yellow or gold uh, circles around a lot of these things that we're not really touching in our production release, but that are, you know, part of the, the overarching platform and how we use it. Um, now, Jupyter Hub we've been using for a long time, and we're, we're still using, uh, which is a multi-user hosted Jupyter Notebooks environment. SageMaker is actually an Amazon managed service for machine learning. We're not using it for the machine learning. We're just experimenting with using it instead of Jupyter Hub to host our Jupyter Notebooks. So in SageMaker, you can launch a Jupyter Notebook instance and then provide users with signed URLs that get them into their workspace while keeping all of your data inside your uh, VPC, your virtual private, private cloud. So your data never leaves uh, the boundary of the cloud. And the goal here is to be able to go eventually into the picture user interface, do your cohort selection, figure out which patients you're interested in and subset the data based on which concepts you're interested in, and then launch a Jupyter Notebook, either in SageMaker or Jupyter Hub, that has the picture query already written for you for what you had selected. And then you can do your Python or your, or your R or your Julia analysis workflow uh, using the picture API as your source of your data. So you keep all the metadata, identifying the resource, identifying the, uh, the data set. Uh, and if the user chooses to add new concepts into that query, it should be fairly straightforward to do so uh, within your notebook environment. But this, this kind of stems from the idea that um, you, know, you can use Transmart to do your exploration. You can use Picture UI to sort of do your feasibility queries. You can use I2B2 to, to to do you know, cohort building. But at the end of the day, to do the actual science, you need an environment that supports the analysis workflow that you want to do, uh, which means you need an environment like Jupyter, where you can use all your Python data science libraries and your pandas and whatnot, or you know, use all of your R uh, analysis code. Uh, and that's part of the I2B2 Transmart platform idea, right? Uh, and of course, you know, through the old I2B2 Transmart uh, interface, or through uh, Growing Bear, or through Picture User Interface, you can download the data. Once you download the data, it's on your local environment, and it's outside the security boundaries of where the environment lives and where the data should stay. And you no longer have direct provenance back to the original source, right? Uh, that that file might be manipulated in some way inadvertently, or uh, you might, you know, over time start to lose sight of where it came from, uh, or what queries you ran to get it. But if instead you have it in Jupyter notebooks, you have a direct line from this is the resource, the hosted resource that I got the data from, and here's the metadata attached to that resource. And these are all the transformations that I've done on the data to get to my results. Uh, and that's really the goal here, is to make it so that, you know, you can use the UI tools to figure out whether you can do the research you want to do and, you know, what data you have available to you. And then you can actually do that research research without ever leaving the hosted environment. Uh, does that answer the question? Well, hopefully it did. Great. Thanks, Jason. We did have one more question from Jean-Lou Rosario. Jean-Lou? Um, Jean uh, maybe some note. Uh, he asks, will Transmart be supported in the future, or will it be replaced by I2B2 Transmart? 
And second, will I2B2 Transmart, is there a vision to replace I2B2 as well with HPBS maybe or something? And let, let me just say from um, the, you know, from my perspective and, and I think the foundation, you know, we still see these as, you know, the I2B2 platform and the Transmart platform both serve particular sets of needs and, and people are you know, productively and, and using these around the world in many labs. Uh, and they will continue. Uh, and both of these are actually components of the I2B2 Transmart environment, uh, the way Jason you know, explains it. And so, you know, for the immediate future, we, we see this as continuing, you know, as having both the I2B2 and Transmart platforms uh, be standalone and available. But for those, you know, who want to use the, the broader environment and you know, that will that will be available. They will be available as components of the overall environment. Um, Jason, would you add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's the intent. So, you know, I2B2 does what it does really well. Uh, Transmart does what it does really well. Uh, and while, you know, I2B2 is fairly actively moving forward, I mean, it's great to see it being released for a while with Wildfly 14 supported. Um, not sure about the version matrix, which version of Java that puts us on, but uh, certainly much uh, newer than the Java 7 that currently Transmart requires. Um, and I think these tools, the use cases and the plugins that they support, to re-implement those from scratch in a newer tool is probably more work than uh, you know, we should do, considering that they still do what they are supposed to do. Now, if we come up with new use cases, or if there's a specific use case that we think a newer tool might do better, um, we should investigate that. But uh, I don't see a world in which every use case in Transmart and every use case in ITB2 has been implemented in a new tool. Uh, that would be a, an awful lot of work to get to where we are now. Okay, thanks, Jason. <clears throat> Diane, anything else? Nope, I think um, I think we're good. So thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we will talk to you next month. Okay, thank you.